welcome to another Science Exchange with UWA. Uh, this is where we want, to, you, we want to promote the relevance of UWA research and its teaching activities to you all. My name is Kirsty. I'm a lab manager with the science faculty here at UWA. And I'm excited to join with you today to learn how geomorphology allows us to experience earthquakes. So before we do get started, I will present our speakers to you all. So we actually have uh, Professor Myra Keep, who's there on, I think you're right. Uh, Mariah, Myra is a structural geologist whose research focuses on how and why rocks deform. Her interests include earthquakes uh, and related hazards in WA, both onshore and offshore, and what controls them. We also have Sean. He's a PhD candidate here um, with the School of Earth Sciences. He began his time at UWA doing a Bachelor of Science in Geology and Earth Science. Uh, and currently, as a, UW, as a PhD student, his research is investigating earthquakes in Western Australia. So, I'll hand over to these two lovely people who will take you through a quick presentation. We'll be presenting for about 30 to um, 35 minutes, and then after that, we'll ask them all the hard questions on what they've presented to us. So without further ado, guys, take it away. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we're going to try and do earthquakes in about 15 minutes with cake. So uh, we'll see how, how well we go. Uh, most people probably know that we have earthquakes at plate boundaries. Most people have heard about plate tectonics. And you've all heard about the Pacific Ring of Fire. Now that's a, a zone where we have a lot of earthquakes. There's also a lot of volcanoes. It's where we have a lot of subducting plates, where one plate is sliding under another one. Australia is quite a long way from the plate boundary. If you, to get from Perth up to uh, the plate boundary, the Pacific Ring of Fire in Indonesia, we've got about 3,000 kilometres to get to the plate boundary in the Southern Ocean, we've got about the same. So we're quite a long way from a plate boundary. So our kind of earthquakes are called intraplate, within a plate. The earthquakes are on the Pacific Ring of Fire are called interplate. They're between plates. Ours are within a plate. But all earthquakes are caused by the same mechanism, which is stress caused by plate tectonics. So you've got these plates moving around the globe, bashing into each other, causing stresses. And that is the cause of every earthquake on the planet. Now, believe it or not, there is something called the world stress map. And this is, this is one version of it. Um, I wouldn't worry about all the different colors. It's just the density of data. Now that's telling you where the greatest stress is on the planet at the moment. And you can see the Pacific Ring of Fire is very well represented They're all along South America and around North America and past the Aleutians, parts of Europe, little bits of Africa, and a little bit in Australia, but nowhere near as dense. Because we are so far from the plate boundary, we do have stress, it does cause earthquakes, but we're not quite in the same category as Indonesia or Japan or California. The earthquakes we do have though are all the more uh, interesting because we, we don't know really why they occur in a lot of places. We're a long way from a plate boundary, but we do have, we have had some big ones and Sean's gonna to talk to you about some of them, including Meckering. And the central slide there at the top is a view of uh, the Meckering fault scarp from the air. The slide you're seeing on the extreme right at the top is also from the Meckering earthquake. And the middle one at the bottom is also from the Meckering earthquake. And the other two on the left are just examples of what happens when you break materials. Because in order to get an earthquake, you actually have to break something. You have to physically break it, break all the bonds. The two pieces no longer fit together. They no longer join together. And that usually happens with a sudden and catastrophic release of energy. And that's the release of energy is what we feel as earthquake waves. Uh, so we need to actually just really break something. Now, some rocks will bend and some rocks will break. And I've got a little uh, demonstration here. I should have said cake and biscuits. I have two different types of Anzac biscuits. I've got Anzac biscuits and I've got Anzac biscuits. You might wonder why am I feeling a little hungry? Perhaps, perhaps not. Some of them though, now these are both Anzac biscuits. There's one from each packet, okay? Um, but they're going to behave differently. They're both made of exactly the same material. We've got the same ingredients, maybe slightly different proportions, maybe baked at different temperatures or for slightly different lengths, but essentially the same material. But if I take this Anzac biscuit, I'm sure you can see that, I can apply, to, I can apply a stress to it, and this one is just going to bend. It doesn't actually break. And hopefully you can see 
I've got a nice bendy biscuit there and it's actually just bent it hasn't broken uh, so it's accommodated it's just sort of you know it's accommodated the stress it hasn't actually broken if I take the other Anzac biscuit I can't do the same thing as again it's exactly the same material it's still an Anzac biscuit it's still got sugar and flour and oats and butter and I don't know what else you put in an Anzac biscuit syrup probably and this one does not want to bend I can't bend it I really have to force it now I have to put a lot more stress I have to really apply the stress to break it and that's it I've severed the bonds I've catastrophically broken it the two halves will never again join so uh, this is broken that's and that would have released some energy. Uh, and so the two biscuits behaved quite differently. And I had to put a lot more stress to break this one than I did for this one, even though they're the same stuff. So the, the, the way the materials, especially the rock materials break, is very much related to what they are and how they form. The other thing that's quite important is just how fast you, you, you actually apply that stress. And I've got one more demonstration. Here's one I prepared earlier. This is a piece of silly putty. You might have seen this stuff, you can buy it all over the place. So if I apply a stress very, very slowly to this, it just kind of stretches. And I'm applying the stress very slowly and the whole thing kind of stress, stretches out and is uh, just going to uh, you know, keep on stretching forever. But if I take exactly the same material and I apply the stress much, much faster, it actually breaks okay and I've got those two ends they've completely broken off and I've severed all the bonds I've had that catastrophic failure uh, the stress <laughs> the stress went right up my arms and, and started rattling around in my brain I'll probably need a little lie down a bit later um, so that's so we call that the strain rate just how fast you break something so if I do that again maybe with this fuller piece a much <laughs> a much faster break a much faster application of stress will just break all those bonds. So when earthquakes occur, we have to break the bonds. Now what you've got in this slide here on the top left, you've got an example of a rock that has not broken. We've applied the stress, but we've applied it maybe slowly, or maybe the rocks are nice and hot and mushy. Maybe the rocks on the top left were a lot more like my, my, uh, my soft, chewy Anzac biscuit. Uh, the rocks on the top right there have actually broken. We've applied a fast stress, we've severed the bonds, and it's a release of energy when you sever those bonds that gives you the shaking that we have. So when we break a rock material, when we have earthquakes, we've actually broken a rock. We've applied a stress. We have to have more stress. The, the amount of stress that we apply has to be more than the, the, than the strength of the rock material. But we don't just leave a gap. We don't just leave some sort of space in the middle of the earth there. You can see all of these pictures are pictures of faults. They're something that has actually broken. We've, create, we've broken the rock material. We've created a geological fault. One side has slipped away from the other, but they're all still sort of touching each other and sealed by something. Um, you can see the one on the top left there has a little bit of quartz veins sort of uh, pasted alongside the fault. There's another vein on the top center. The one on the top right has actually got a lot of clay smeared along it. There's another vein uh, on the bottom right. And on the bottom left side there, you can see a fault plane. You can see the orange layer on one side is much higher than the orange layer on the other side of the fault where the person is standing at the bottom there. You can see it's slipped down, it's moved, uh, but it's still touching. The, the fault surfaces are still touching each other. They just, the bonds have been broken through. So what happens in nature is we get a lot of vein materials. Anytime you have a fault, you can get fluids running through them. It's the same kind of process that would actually form gold deposits and metal deposits as well. Uh, there becomes a fluid pathway. And fluids like, uh, they'll have lots of, lots of quartz in them. And the quartz often sort of uh, crystallizes out and gives us nice quartz veins like the slide on the bottom, the picture on the bottom right there. So it's a bit like nature's glue. The rocks will heal themselves. You, you'll break them, they'll slip, but then they will seal themselves again. The trouble is once they're broken, it's like breaking the handle off your, off your favorite mug. Once you've glued it back on, it's never gonna be as strong again. So you'd be a little wary about having your favorite cup of tea in the broken mug, just in case that handle falls off. So quartz and other fluids, um, which precipitate on, on fault surfaces and veins are like nature's glue, and they're gonna hold things together 
but they're always going to be weak. Now, this is where the earthquakes occur in Western Australia. There we go. I've just highlighted the, where they are. Now, what you're seeing on the right there is a geological map, and the colours represent different types of rock. And we're just going to have a look at the, the rock types in Western Australia and how they concentrate the earthquakes. So that's a geological map of Western Australia, and I'm just going to highlight some of the main bits for you. That's the first bit. Now, those two big pink, pink bits are the in the south. That's the Yilgarn Craton, and very in the far north there, that's the Pilbara. These rocks are what we call Archean in age. So they are 4.6 billion to 2.5 billion years old. See, these are some of the oldest rocks in the world, uh, certainly some of the oldest in Australia. Say that out loud, 4.6 billion, that's 4,600 million years old. They're some of the earliest rocks on the planet. So they form the core of Western Australia. Now, surrounding those, you can see the bits in blue and brown and pink and yellow at the bottom. Those are what we call, the age of those is what we call Proterozoic. Now, that is slightly younger, but still very old. 2.5 billion years to 541 million years old. This is still largely uh, before life started on our planet, for the most part. I've colored the Proterozoic ones in slightly different colors, They're, because some of them are sediments, some of them are from, from, from volcanoes and magmas and lavas. Uh, so they all, they've all got slightly different compositions, just like our Anzac biscuits. And on the very left-hand side there, that blue color, that's much younger. That's what we call Phanerozoic. It's 541 million years old till today. And that's what forms the basis of the geology of Western Australia. So we've got all of these different blocks of different age, all sitting there, glued together by faults, which have veins and other things on them. Uh, and so we're going to make a little model of that. Now, the Yilgarn Craton itself, uh, even though it's really old, 4.6 billion years, uh, it's divided into lots of separate bits. It's not just one bit, it's lots of separate bits of continent that uh, crashed into each other uh, back in the Archean. So there's quite a few different recognizable elements even, even within that old bit, and we're going to be playing around with those. So you can see there's some, everywhere you've got a change in color there on the right hand side between the green and the purple and the orange, we've got some big fault breaks. And these are really old, deep faults that have been around almost since the beginning of our planet, I should say, because uh, they're still in the Archean. So what we are going to do, we are, we're going to build a little model of uh, the geology of Western Australia. I'm going to basically be looking at the south part. So I'm going to have the, the big pink bit in the middle with all the faults on it, a little bit of the blue to the left, and the yellow uh, around the bottom, which is the Albany Fraser, so uh, down where, where Albany to Esperance. And I'm going to be making this model using a whole bunch of different types of uh, delicious food items that I found in the, uh, in the supermarket this morning. So we're going to switch cameras now, and I'm going to show you the model, and we're going to um, start playing around with some of the specimens. So hopefully you can all see my cake model at the moment. Yes, we've got the cake cam. <laughs> Excellent. See, this only happens in science, right? Cake cam, really? Uh, so what I have tried to do, let's just try and get you oriented a little bit. So this direction here is north, okay? So if I, if I was walking up this direction, I'd be walking up to Brew. Perth is sitting around here. I should point this. Perth is sitting around here. Albany would be down here. This is... I'll be coming around to Esperance along here. And this big swatch of stuff in the middle is that pink blob, the Archean Yilgarn Craton. Now what I've done, I've sort of half finished the model to try and save time. I've got some different bits of fruit cake. So I've got some dark fruit cake and some light fruit cake. You probably can't see the difference, but believe me, they're all delicious. Um, and I've got some dark and light fruit cake making all the different bits of the Yilgarn Craton. And you can see this pink stuff here. I've put some frosting on to act as a geological glue, to act as uh, those veins, those materials that would help glue the faults together. So that's our old bit. This is our Archean right here. Now down here for the Albany Fraser, I've used, uh, I'll just put them up so you can see, I've used some lamingtons. Okay, Cam, there we go. Let me find out where my angles are. I've used some lamingtons. I've stuck them all together with some frosting, and that's going to represent the Albany Fraser, which, which wraps around the Yulgarn Craton here, part of the Proterozoic. And over here, I've got 
my Perth Basin, with I've got some beautiful Madeira cake over here that you can see. Uh, so it's still cake, just but it's but it's a different type of cake, so it will have different properties, just like my Anzac cookies. I've put some icing sugar over the top because we have sediments. So I'm just going to put a little bit more the sediment is all over the place. And I had some Smarties on just so you could see how things are moving. Um, and I'll probably just put a few more on. There we go. This, they just sort of act like, like markers so you can see if and when things are moving. So when we then start to apply a stress, uh, a tectonic stress from plate tectonics, we can try and see which of these are actually moving. Okay, so there's a, there's a few more, and I'll just, there we go, I'll just liberally sprinkle some all over the Albany Fraser belts, Smarties in the Albany Fraser belt. And now we're going to get really highly technical because we want to apply tectonic stress. And tectonic stresses are usually in plane because of the, the plates are moving around the outside of our sphere. So I'm going to use, no expense spared, I'm going to use my, never, never before attempted on the live Zoom, I'm going to use my cake mallet to try and uh, impose a stress on my cake model. And we're going to see which directions move. So first of all, I'm going to come in from the south. So here I am, just to get you oriented again. I'm in the Southern Ocean. Albany is over here. Perth is over here. And I'm going to see what happens if I apply a bit of a stress. All of these faults are, uh, are, are all cut in there, lined with um, some, some beautiful uh, frosting there. And we're going to see what moves. If I start applying the stress, you can start to see my Albany phrase a bit moving. I don't know if the cake cam is picking, you can see it all squeezing together, not surprisingly. The interesting thing is exactly what's moving. It's the bits between some of my faults in the Albany Fraser, the bits between my Lamingtons are moving, but it's not really affecting the Yulgarn so much. And Sean's got a bit to say about that when I, when I finish this. If I come over uh, this side, again, never before attempted on a live Zoom, so I'm coming in from Adelaide, <laughs> I'm gonna whack in to Western Australia, as you do on a Tuesday afternoon. I'm just gonna hit the edge of the, of the Albany Fraser. Look what happens now. See, my Albany Fraser is starting to move out the way. I hope the KCAM is picking that up, but it's really moved everything. Every time something moves on this model, we have an earthquake, okay? So uh, I've, I've managed to cause a big gap in here and I've, <laughs> I've destroyed a few Lamington, sorry, casualties of fires. Uh, and as I push this, it's actually these bits of the Albany Fraser that are moving. These faults are moving a little bit, but it's actually quite hard. If I'm to, to move something by forcing it head on is quite hard. The easier way to do it is to actually come in slightly from the side. And if you come in slightly from the side, things have an opportunity to slip out of the way. So if I come in down here, now we're, we're attacking Albany <laughs> with the cake mallet on the cake cam. Here we go. And now we're gonna start moving. And again, see now my Albany Fraser is slipping away the other way and I'm beginning to move some of my faults in my Yulgarn crater. And you see those Smarties moving a little bit? So we're completely deforming Western Australia and it's these old faults. Some of these faults have been here for four billion years or two billion years, and they're still the ones that are moving today. And did you see, I don't know if you caught it, but all of the Albany Fraser stuff starts slipping sideways out of the way. And Sean's gonna have quite a bit to say about that. And my last one, I'm going to come in up here. I'm coming in. We're coming in up uh, North Hampton here. So I'm just going to show it this way, and you can start to see some of those parties move. Well, we just we just applied a stress to uh, sort of Geraldton, and we I think we I think we just destroyed Perth actually. Um, so that's those deep faults are the ones causing the earthquakes today. They're the ones that are reactivating, and now we're going to hear about a real live one that actually happened. Uh, relatively recently, and I'm going to hand over to Sean. That concludes the earthquake segment of the presentation. Um, you're all earthquake enthusiasts at this point, but we want to make you ambassadors of the subject. Um, so we're going to arm you with some um, more up-to-date information uh, that isn't billions of years old. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the most recent earthquakes that happened in Western Australia. So I'll just take you 52 years back into the past. Um, if you haven't already heard of the Mepping earthquake, it's worth going and Googling and looking up. 
Um, it is the uh, one of the best examples of intraplate earthquakes in the world. Um, and it spontaneously hit uh, the town of Meckering about 150 kilometers east of Perth 52 years ago, and it completely demolished the town. Um, so uh, in the next slide, you can see that uh, it was a huge earthquake, uh, magnitude 6.5, which is very big. Um, and as you can see on the right hand side there, uh, the damage radius, uh, the felt radius was massive, uh, encompassing a very large area of Western Australia. And as you can see, Earth is uh, very close to the epicenter there. Um, so that kicked off a whole generation of earthquake research in Western Australia, um, with the obvious big question of, uh, is Perth um, at risk of large earthquakes? Um, if you don't know too much about the Meckering earthquake, great place to start is with your grandparents, because um, it was a big festive occasion in Perth. Uh, anybody that you ask over the age of about 60 has a great story to tell about it, most likely. Uh, so moving on, um, these are just some photos of Meckering and some of the damage that happened. You can see the highway uh, over there um, was uplifted, uh, dog for scale, as you can see, um, and the railway tracks were uh, bent quite considerably as well. So it was a fairly um, damaging earthquake. Um, and continuing, that's some of the damage uh, that actually happened in the town. Um, the entire town was completely wiped out. So if you can imagine that occurring in an area closer to Perth, um, the effects could be quite devastating. Uh, but that's not actually what I was supposed to be talking to you about. I'm talking about the uh, most recent earthquake that we had in West Australia, um, which formed a very small hill, uh, formed big thrills for me, the small hills in the landscape. Um, and that's actually a picture of me sitting next to uh, West Australia's newest hill, um, playing the guitar. Actually, what I wanted to say, I forgot to say this before, Meckering earthquake is also pretty important because it's the only earthquake that I'm aware of in the world that has its own beer. Um, they brewed this for the 50th anniversary of Meckering earthquake. They called it Richter Ale, which is a great geology. Anyway, that's the whole reason I was holding that bottle. So um, September 2018, let's go just back a couple of years, uh, a lot of uh, earthquake activity spontaneously started happening in Western Australia. You will have remembered it from the press. Uh, there was a lot of talk about earthquakes. You might have even felt one. But the major one was um, the Lake Muir earthquake, which occurred just south of here, um, near Albany. Uh, there were three big events. There was, uh, the main one was a magnitude 5.7 earthquake, which is quite big. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see that it was felt very widely around Australia. On the left-hand side, that's the, uh, the first earthquake. Um, and you can see there's a lot of felt reports uh, that came out of Perth. Um, and then the second aftershock had generated even more reports, um, probably because everybody was uh, in the mood for reporting earthquakes at that point. So they got onto it. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through what happens when an earthquake occurs in Western Australia from a research point of view. So uh, on the night of that earthquake occurring, um, I was contacted by Geoscience Australia um, and they were basically looking at some of the uh, um, satellite data in the area uh, that's able to depict if there's any um, changes in elevation, very small changes in elevation. Um, so we got some data in from the satellite and uh, that data on the, looked like what you can see on the right hand side there. Um, and that basically allowed us to, to determine that there had actually been a change in surface height in the area that the earthquake occurred a little schematic diagram that I put together just below that, um, showing that we could expect about a 30 centimeter rise in the topography of the area. Um, next slide is showing, ah, yeah, there we go. So second step was to um, pack your dad, jump in a car and drive down to the area. And this is why people do geology to go get into beautiful areas like this and do a bit of field work. Um, and uh, basically analyze the earthquake and see what the damage was and see what happened. Um, the earthquake itself occurred pretty much in the middle of nowhere, um, right in the middle of a big farming paddock, uh, which is great um, because uh, it was a really beautiful place to work. Um, there was one farmstead just nearby, and those are the photos you're seeing now. Uh, the earthquake did do a little bit of damage. It um, managed to completely destroy a water tank and it cracked some walls as well. Um, it, uh, the first earthquake 
um, knocked some very valuable plates off a farmer's um, mantelpiece. Uh, so we put them back on the mantelpiece and then the second uh, earthquake came through and knocked them off and broke them properly. Um, but moving on, uh, this, is the, this is the very exciting small hill. And look, I assure you, everybody interested in earthquakes, all five people in Australia, were totally riveted when they saw this photo. Um, so that's, the, that's essentially Australia's newest hill. It's about 40 centimetres high. Um, we did, we did roly-polies down it. We drove cars over it. It was great. Um, you can see, very interesting, uh, a nice geological feature there, the fissure at the back. Um, it's kind of like a little mini version of the one they flew the plane through in 2012. Um, but uh, that's a, a very a signature um, uh, indicator of a thrust uh, fault scar. Uh, and we, uh, we also, you know, as part of the analysis process, we also flew a drone around, we collected some um, ortho photos, and we put together a um, digital elevation model, which basically just shows the very fine detailed topography of the area. And you can kind of see there's a line there in that, that bottom image, which is showing the length of the scarf, which was a good five, um, five kilometres in length. So if you can imagine a five kilometre area of land being lifted by 40 centimetres, there's a lot of energy involved in that. There's another photo of the scarf. And the third step is to actually go in there and do a bit of manual labour, um, which is, of course, the not so nice part of the field trip. Um, we spent about a day digging this, this trench uh, for the purpose of, as the next slide will show, um, just seeing what happened uh, in the cross section um, in the landscape around the fault scar. And this uh, image illustrates that this is what um, earthquake geologists spend a lot of time doing called uh, paleo seismological investigation. Basically, seeing how the uh, top soil and the top stratigraphy in an area um, has moved when an earthquake has occurred. And as you can see, uh, you can quite clearly trace out um, a thrust fault through there, uh, which proves that there was actually um, a brand new scarf being formed in the area. Uh, and that's just a great little schematic diagram that we put together as well, very clearly showing the fault plane and that fissure at the background. And there's another photo um, of the small hill uh, intersecting a little track in the area as well. Um, so we uh, traced the, the length of the scarf. We spent about five days walking around in the field. Um, I was basically being remote controlled by Geoscience Australia by phone, um, just trying to go where they told me to, to, to find the scarf and trace it out. Um, and we managed to basically line up different segments over about five kilometres um, to form uh, sort of the, the general shape of the, the fault scarf. And the whole reason that we're doing this and we're trying to trace out the scarf is because we're trying to work out some reason that it's occurred where it has and why it might have occurred in the shape and location. Um, and one of the, the main um, angles that we approach that with is by looking at some of the pre-existing faults that are already in the area. So we use a data set called aeromagnetic data, um, which basically, without getting too technical, um, allows us to see what the geology looks like beneath the um, soil in the area. Um, and all the white lines that you see on this image here are just faults that probably do exist in the area that we've traced out from the aeromagnetic data. Um, and as you can see right in the middle of there, the fault scarp that formed from the earthquake aligns very closely with one of those lines. So that suggests that maybe um, what's happened here is a very old fault that, that has existed for millions of years um, may have been reactivated in, um, in the recent stress field uh, to form that earthquake. And to relate it back to the cake cam, if I can do a cheeky switch, the earthquake occurred about here where this little red smut is. Um, and notably, that's very close to the boundary between um, Lamington, orogeny down here, and um, the main fruit cake of Australia. Uh, so what, what really happened is um, you can expect, if we have a bit of east-west movement, which is currently what's happening in Australia, you can clearly see, as Murray demonstrated, that that Lamington is moving relative to um, the fruit cake, and 
that is a very simplified case version of what might have happened in the area of the form of that earthquake. So um, that is the most recent fault scar that's formed in Western Australia. But as you can see from this image on the left, there are actually um, a whole lot of other ones that exist. Um, every black line there uh, most likely represents uh, one or more ancient earthquakes that might have occurred within the last 10,000 years or so. Um, and that shows us very clearly that there's been a lot of seismic, earth, uh, seismic activity in Western Australia. And a lot of big earthquakes uh, have actually happened uh, before we began recording earthquakes and uh, considerably uh, further back before we started actually um, observing them ourselves. Uh, so the big question is, uh, we saw that the Lake Muir earthquake, the most recent one, occurred on a fault that previously existed. So maybe if we map out a lot of the faults in Western Australia, we'd be able to um, we'd be able to identify faults that could be more prone to activating and that would give us an idea of where future earthquakes might occur. Um, I, I thought it would be a good idea to try doing that um, and I started mapping out areas uh, where there are lots of old fault scarps in Australia. Um, as you can see, I tried a small area there just east of Perth and there were so many faults and so many lines I just gave up um, pretty quickly. But the moral of that story is that it's very difficult to actually identify any area that might be particularly prone to earthquake risk because there are so many pre-existing structures in the area, it's hard to actually pinpoint one that may be particularly prone to rupturing. Um, so that, that concludes the Lake Muir um, segment. And just before I leave, uh, just some unscripted rambling about uh, the, the big questions in earthquake research in Western Australia right now. Um, so you don't need to look at this uh, table too, too deeply, but trust what I say when I say that about four metres of uh, topography has been built in the last 50 years um, due to earthquakes, uh, which doesn't sound like much. But if you uh, consider that that activity, um, if that would have been going on for the last 1 million years, we would have expected to see about 20 to 40 um, or even more kilometres of topography in Western Australia, which we just don't see. Um, Western Australia is very flat. So one of the big questions are, um, where are the mountains? Uh, why, why isn't there a lot of topography in an area that's uh, building quite a lot of topography right now? Um, and that may be suggesting that uh, the seismicity in Western Australia has actually increased considerably um, in just the last uh, 50 to a couple of hundred years. The other big question that we're talking about right now is if the seismic activity is actually moving around Western Australia. Um, Myra said before that there's the, the main belt of seismicity near Perth, um, which is shown there in the red. Uh, but just in recent years, in the last few decades, uh, it's actually started moving to various other areas and there's been other swarms um, starting up. So that's been another big question that we're, we're trying to look at right now is why might seismicity be moving? Um, but as my final slide will demonstrate, we're really not sure what's happening um, or what's causing it. Uh, but in 2020, the obvious candidates are 5G, Kanye West, something to do with Donald Trump, um, all the classic uh, conspiracy theories that are popping out now, I'm sure, are also causing earthquakes in Western Australia. Um, I think I've got one, yep, there you go. And if you'd like to see some of the earthquake activity that's actually happening right now, um, you can jump onto that website uh, and, and monitor them yourself. Anyway, that's all that I've got to say about the topic. So thank you for sticking around um, and try, um, try injecting a bit of earthquakes into your next party conversation. Thank you so much, guys. That was so interesting. Uh, I know I've learned a lot. I probably haven't touched on any uh, geology and earthquake type stuff since my first year at uni quite a few years ago. So no, that was really good. Um, all right, well, let's get into some questions. We do have one here, one from Brady, who said, great talk. Um, and wants to know if there's a risk of damaging earthquakes in the Perth area 
And if so, are buildings built to withstand such quakes? The answer to that is maybe and not really. There's always a chance, even the, the Meckering earthquake was felt in Perth. Uh, there was actually damage to buildings in Perth. The cathedral had some damage. Perth is not really earthquake engineered, especially the downtown area. If you, you know, we, we divided between the hills and the flat part, and the flat part is a big sand pit. We're all built on sand. You know, you have a look at any house being built in your neighbourhood, it's just on sand. So if there were, as it were, an earthquake that did cause uh, more shaking in Perth, we would probably have a lot of damage because none of our buildings are designed for earthquakes. And in fact, if you think about a lot of buildings, especially big buildings down, downtown, what have they got underneath them? Big car park, sometimes even multi-storey. So you've got huge buildings built on a big empty space and you know the soft sediments will cause a lot of liquefaction, especially in the Perth city area because it's reclaimed land. So uh, yes, we probably wouldn't be in a very good situation, but the, the likelihood is, is, is not high, but if it did happen, it wouldn't be pretty. I don't think there's much comfort in knowing that we're built on one big sand dune in Perth, so <laughs> might just all slide into the ocean. If it's not gonna be rising seawater, it might be an earthquake. Um, all right, so we've had another couple come through. We'll see how many we can get through, just um, conscious of time. So one from Deborah, she's asking, um, do large aquifers affect earthquake patterns slash effects? They, uh, earthquakes have a big impact on aquifers. Um, and the vice, vice versa is probably true. Uh, for the Lake Muir earthquake, um, it actually uh, really messed with the groundwater um, in the area. And um, about 150 kilometers away, there was reports of um, uh, water bores on farmers' properties, um, leaking water and flooding paddocks. Uh, so that's an example of, a, of an earthquake really mucking around with uh, so when you say messing with the groundwater, do you mean that it changed the level of the groundwater or? Yeah, so it would have, um, it would have changed the level of groundwater within um, the aquifer in the area uh, and that um, caused uh, some catastrophe in other areas um, very far off in that case. It's just, it's just a so it's sudden increase in pressure. So suddenly increase in fluid pressure from the earthquake. So those, those disturbances in groundwater would be temporary and then they'd go back to normal. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, another one from Ben here. Um, he's thanked you both for your talk and he wanted to um, ask if you know how old these reactivated bolts might be. Do we know an age of the one potentially from um, the one in 2018 or? No, no idea, but probably, probably something like the proto or 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 something like that. So very old, you know, on the scale of hundreds of millions of years. Can I ask a question off the back of that? How would we usually date an earthquake? Like, how would we look at dating those kind of faults? Is there a way to look at that? You, you, you can try. One of the problems we have is it's very difficult to take any earthquake and link it to a specific fault, especially as we can't see most of them because we need geophysics to see through all of the, the vegetation. You can try and date some of the coating on some of the faults. You, you, might be, you might get lucky there. You can try some optical dating of certain minerals, uh, but most of the time you're just having a look at the rock mass. And you have to realize that so, some of those faults have been reused many times since they were formed. So a fault that's 2 billion years old could have failed 3,000 more times since then. All right, probably have time for one more question, guys. So I'll ask um, Don's, because he's been sitting there for a little while. Um, how deep was the epicenter at Lake Muir and the Meckering earthquake? Uh, it was very shallow. Well, Meckering was Meckering basically was on the surface underneath the cemetery yeah. um, of all places. The Lake Muir earthquake was also very shallow, uh, probably about two kilometers or at least within 10 kilometers. Um, but a requirement to make a fault scar on the surface is um, it's important for the earthquake to actually have occurred very shallow. So that's a good indicator of a shallow earthquake. Okay, great. Look, we've only got two, I think, quite quick questions here. So let's get to them. Um, the first one is from um, G Giles, who was in relation to when we were talking about the aquifer, um, asking, would an earthquake have similarly mucked up the nearby Lake Muir when the earthquake happened at Lake Muir? And then after that, Samantha wants to know, is a tsunami likely to happen with the type of quakes we get in WA? 
we went and ran and we, we had a look at some of the bores near Lake Muir. Um, but if there were if there were changes to the actual lake itself, they would have been very subtle um, and nothing was reported or we didn't observe anything drastic in the area um, to do with the hydrogeology. Um, but likely given that the aquifer was disrupted, something small would have happened at least. Um, yeah, no, in order to get a tsunami, you need to have the earthquake offshore. So you need the earthquake to happen underwater. So when you offset that scar, as Sean said, five kilometers of 40 centimeters uh, mass. Uh, so you need to be able to uh, offset that, uh, that scarp underwater. In order to do that, you need to have about magnitude 7.9. And we haven't had anything that big in WA. So all of our earthquakes, uh, the good news about our earthquakes is for the most part, they're quite small, magnitude threes, three and a half. What was the your 5.7. So, so we don't really have anything much bigger. So 5.7, a 5.2, a 6.5 in WA is enormous for WA, but nowhere near enough to cause a tsunami. All right, great. Thanks for that, guys. Thank you so much for taking the questions. And thank you, everybody, for uh, putting those questions through to our speakers for today. And just so you know, I think the cake cam looked not only delicious, but also very informative. We were able to see some great movement there. So. Um, thanks for coming to the table with something so different to present to the audience. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and we thank you for being part of today.